two, one. David Maguire, you are the CEO of the Diagrama Foundation. You're also the owner of one of the finest beards in all of social care. Welcome to the Care Home Show. Thank you so, so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's, uh, it's great to have you on the show as well. We've, um, we've spoken on a, a number of different occasions about creating a podcast together. Uh, so just really, really good to, to have you on the show. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing about your experience and your learnings around uh, COVID and the insights that you can share for our audience. Um, but before we get into that, can you share a little bit about your, uh, your background and about the Diagrama Foundation itself? Uh, yes, of course. I'm David Maguire, as you said. Is, um, I've been working for the organization, uh, the Agrama Foundation, which is a charity for the last 20 years. Uh, I started in, in Spain because the organization or, or their sister organization started in Spain. Um, I started as a care worker, a, a residential worker. I am a teacher myself and I have never taught anybody in my whole life. I never worked in a school in my whole life, but I was working in a um, secure establishment for young people who uh, committed crimes. From there, I was lucky enough to promote and, um, and in 2008, I was asked to, uh, to come here to the UK, maybe because of my uh, surname, but as you can see, I am. I have a very strong Spanish accent, even though my mom is from Lewisham, my dad is Spanish, and um, I came here to set up the organization. At the beginning, I was um, uh, lost because I didn't know anything about the country. I needed to do a lot of research and and, and so on, and. Um, and now we are in the UK, a uh, charity which have about uh, 200 uh, member staff. We run one uh, Eden store, which is one uh, elderly care home in Essex, in Clacton and Sea. Uh, we run three homes in Orpington, covering house, for adults with learning disabilities. Uh, we have two um, semi-dependent homes in Canterbury. And, uh, and nationally, we have a fostering and adoption agency uh, across uh, uh, England and Wales. That is what we are um, running in this moment in time. And, uh, and this is the organization. And I know that you've got aspirations to, uh, to, to kind of build and build the business and to, and to grow and to develop on, on all the great work that you do. I think one thing just, to, uh, I guess, to kind of double, double down on for a second is the fact that you've you're one of these special humans that's managed to make the journey all the way from being a care worker through to being the CEO of a, of a great organization. So um, I feel like that might almost be a podcast in itself at some point, maybe in the, uh, maybe in the future, but it just goes to show that, the, that there are opportunities there. I guess that comes with hard work and commitment and uh, kind of uh, uh, luck as well, of course. Uh, Got to have a good healthy dose of luck as, uh, as you go through, the, uh, go through that. A surname like my one. <laughs> Say again, sorry? And a surname uh, like my one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, of course. Um, okay, great. So um, thank you for that. We, we, as I mentioned earlier, so we, we'd already talked about creating a podcast anyway, but when your uh, article was released in The, in the Guardian, uh, it, it seemed like a great idea to be able to unpack that a little bit to find out about what your experience of COVID was like and your experiences, because you've, you've laid that out in the, in the article in The, in the Guardian, because what you'd done is you'd, the, the, the article effectively was your diary. So you diarized there each day, you broke down kind of the individual things that were happening on a day by day basis. And yeah. if I've got it right, so The Guardian didn't publish absolutely everything, but they broke down some of the key days and the key headings and some of the, some of the things that, went, that, that, that were going on from a governmental perspective, from a legislation perspective in the home, what you were feeling like, all of that type of, uh, type of stuff. And it's quite, um, uh, quite, it's almost, well, I, I suppose not, not surprisingly, it's almost like a, quite a, an emotional ride going through the various different gates and the de de various different instances because we, we, we've all... I guess witnessed this either directly or, or indirectly. So to get a, a spotlight shot on one particular individual's experience is quite, really quite interesting. So tell me, uh, t tell me about the article and really just how did that come together? Um, well, it it was um, 
a combination of uh, of uh, different circumstances. I, um, I have a, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Julie, who asked me to write uh, down everything that how was happening. Uh, one of the things it was for learning uh, ourselves because we needed to learn uh, what were we doing good or bad as um, in this situation from the chaotic uh, days when everything started and there was no paper rolling in the uh, supermarkets to uh, to now I mean after a few months where we still COVID free and uh, and what we went through in the whole journey um, that it was uh, something that uh, we do, we did also because of that news of we are COVID free in all our services uh, there was some interest from several um, several uh, press I mean the uh, uh, different the Guardian and, I mean, there was some uh, some interest and uh, with the combination of uh, the government Boris Johnson uh, criticizing the um, uh, the field the care field and, and, and all the deaths that has been in care homes I think all together um, finalize in having the uh, the diary in the uh, in the Guardian. Sure. Part of it. And it and it, it does make for interesting reading. I'll I'll make sure that the link to the uh, to the article is included in the show notes, just so if anyone hasn't seen it already, they can they can go through reading that uh, the article already. Um, was it? I guess as somebody who uh, I know you were somebody who's extremely hardworking, and I say quite quite humble. Was it? How did it feel, kind of getting the the media spotlight from I guess from other media organisations, and then uh, maybe even other people from within the sector who are interested to find out more about the story? Uh, oh wow! Well, uh, I was surprised. I mean, I didn't um, I didn't expect all these uh, responses. Um, um, funny enough, I I knew about this article because I had uh, several um, emails through my, my Diagramma Foundation um, email address and uh, thanking me about um, speaking out uh, for, the ser I mean, for the care sector and people that I don't know at all. And, um, and from families, I mean, you cannot imagine, from families, care workers, um, people that has been in the in hospitals from from a lot of uh, very nice people um, thanking me and also I mean people that was in my school and didn't know anything about me for years and and from the US from Mexico I can tell you from from Australia there are some people that they've been reading it and, and I was so surprised about all this to be honest Got you. Yeah, because I've had a couple of messages having posted on LinkedIn just to say I'm, 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 I'm doing an interview with, uh, with David McGuire. I've had a couple of messages uh, both on the conversation thread and then directly just saying really inspirational story. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for having, having him on the, on, on the show. So it seems like you've, you've made a really, really positive Im impression by doing that. And I guess just opening up and just being transparent about the, the the set of circumstances i think there's there's a lot of appetite from people within the sector and people outside of the sector just to really kind of try and understand exactly what's going on we've all got this i guess insatiable thirst for for knowledge to understand and appreciate the the, the ever evolving ever ever changing landscape that is covid as a, as a whole or whether that be covid in care homes or not but i think we, we we're as humans we're we're naturally naturally curious, so to get that really kind of nitty gritty, real, authentic experience just laid out in, in into it on a blow by blow basis, it, it, it certainly um, uh, it certainly uh, uh, certainly engaged me, and it's obviously engaged other people kind of in just thinking about kind of what's everything that's been everything that's been going on. So, uh, was it how, how did you come up with the idea of doing the, 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 the COVID diary, if you like, do you, do you keep a diary or a schedule kind of uh, uh, typically, or was it just something that you thought of specifically to do for, for during the COVID experience? Um, well, the thing is, um, I normally, when things, important things happens, normally I, I, I tend to write it down. However, I mean, in these press, I mean, I was very precise because too many things were happening in, in that moment. It was very difficult to think wisely while all these were happening and uh, and it was as i said my colleague it was my colleague who um 
who told me or asked me, uh, why don't you write everything before you forget? Because with everything, um, and I'm pretty sure I, 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 I forgot some something that I needed to go back and say, oh yes, that day this is what happened. But we didn't want to, um, we really didn't want to lose the opportunity to have something to uh, think about it in the future or to uh, even to share with other people for uh, best practice. Um, that's all. I mean, it's, uh, the the more we we work together, the more people we save, and um, and and that is how everything come to light uh, in, in terms of doing the diary. And uh, and we still doing it because we haven't finished, and um, and and things happening every day. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think one thing, obviously, that that you can't um, discount and forget. Obviously, the the the, the tragic human cost of this whole set of uh, the, the COVID circumstances. But I think it's important as well to, um, to, to, to look to the future and look for opportunities to learn and develop, to use the word wise earlier. Uh, I think it, by, by, by doing what you've done, it enables both you and other people to become more wise to the situation so that hopefully people can be kind of more prepared for, uh, I mean, whether it's going to be kind of the, the, the second wave or third wave or however many waves we end up having or, or just being prepared in the future for difficult sets of, sets of circumstances, being self-aware enough to be able to think, right, okay, so let's, let's document this, let's try and deeply understand it. I know from my own experience that when I, when I write things down, by mm. committing pen to paper or typically it's not pen to paper it's usually tapping away in a laptop but by emptying my my brain of uh something whatever the subject matter is it helps me to be able to almost free up more space by because i've i've framed the way i think about something i've i've reinforced what my my own kind of personal thinking or belief is around that and then once I've, I've i've done that accurately it then kind of frees up more space to think a little bit more strategically a little bit more clearly about kind of what what is to come if you like and it was another um, another way to express the emotions because all the emotions you had in that moment, the anger, the um, being very scared, uh, sad, everything, I don't know, everything that you are having at the same time is a way also to, to express it. I mean, to put it there because uh, it's like a therapy, if that makes sense. It's, it's like... You need to put everything out because it's, it's a, a lot of things happening all the time and, and all the moment. It's something that helped me a lot to, uh, to relax, as you say, to unload everything and, and think from with a perspective. Uh, because in, if you are in, sometimes you cannot see the horizon. It's better to come out a little bit and, and see everything, how, how it's happening. Yeah, there's, um, uh, there's a popular British saying uh, that talks about working on your business rather than in your business and kind of getting the balance right between those two worlds and I guess that's by doing that you're uh, my I have a I have a coach my my coach describes it as getting up in the helicopter uh, and I think you mentioned perspective it is about that sometimes you've got to lift yourself out of the day to day uh, to be able to, to 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 kind of look upwards and think think forwards if you uh, if you like so yeah I think that's really interesting and useful learning for for people i think it's it, i know that it's really difficult n- not to be stuck kind of looking at what's immediately immediately fr- in front of you and sometimes there's there's definitely a place for making sure that just everything immediately in front of you is uh is, is sorted but equally as well you need to look out onto the horizon as as well to kind of think about what's what's coming and i guess where we're where we are today i've i've heard from people that are, are kind of connected to the uh, public health england world if you like the the expectation is of course that a second wave is coming quite how big and how high that peak will come it i guess depends on there's an element of luck but then there's an element of how the the, the people the country the the world even responds to responds to the to the situation uh, and kind of what provisions are, are put in place by the government to make sure that it, it, if, if, it, if there is to be a second wave, that it can be, I guess, as uh, as as um, mitigated against as 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 humanly humanly possible. So, um, one, I know one of the big things that you talked about in the in the diary is about the fact that you decided to. N- not to follow the guidance from the from the government and from from my understanding it was kind of 
really to take a, a more proactive approach in in certain instances which uh, I, I know a lot of a lot of leaders of care home business did exactly the same thing uh, to and, and in the initial instance that was really quite uh, controversial um, and uh, it maybe didn't go, go go down particularly well with some people um, tell me about what you decided uh, well why did you decide not to follow the, the the government's guidance and then give me some idea of the type of things that you decided to kind of uh, carve your own path with, if you will? Um, well, um, my whole team were uh, checking the guidance every every day. I mean, I was, um, we were having uh, SMT meetings um, every day and we were checking what was going on. However, I was also looking what uh, was happening in other countries, like why before? And, uh, and it, it it was like looking everything coming. It was going to come. Why we were going to be so late responding? I mean, I saw that other countries for being late, they had more problems. Then what I I said to my team, we need to react now. Uh, and two or three weeks before, we started to buy masks and buy some things, and that wasn't controversial yet. Uh, but little by little. When I decided on the 12th of uh, March to close the um, lockdown, the, um, the, the elderly care home, and on the 13th of March, the three other Woodland disability homes. And when I say that, is I, uh, people were not able to go to the community. Uh, and, and imagine when you work with people with um, different, I mean, uh, with autism and, and, and you you take that decision from one day to other, um, you need to manage what are going to be the reactions. After that, it was um, no visiting from families and you need to manage all the family that they are used to. And, and, and they challenge you saying, well, the government is not saying anything. Um, and, and you need to explain, well, you need to explain how this is happening in other countries and how it's coming. It's coming. And, um, and I remember uh, some families that um, they were fine, uh, just challenging, challenging us a little bit, but uh, now they are so, so happy uh, and, and they are praising us all the time. But uh, in, that, in that moment, I, I think they were like, why are they so over exaggerating if the government is not doing anything? It's like that was the first uh, part. After that, um, we took the decision to... Um, to wear a mask in the whole shift. Um, that is something that uh, the government said that it wasn't uh, necessary, but it, unless in care home, in hospital, yes, but in care home, uh, it didn't. We we uh, started to use a uh, mask um, in the whole shift. It was more, the uh, well, the controversy was more because we didn't have enough stock for, for uh, using in, in a daily basis. Then we needed to, uh, to reuse the mask for four or five shifts. And it's something that um, you, you don't like to not just do it yourself, but also asking other people to do it. Um, but we didn't have, I mean, none of the, our residents had the, um, um, the, the symptoms and we decided to okay then if they don't have the symptoms uh, we are the one who can kill them we are the one who can spread then why don't we put masks and we avoid the maximum we can the spread of the virus that was the second uh, I think a second decision that was at the beginning we didn't know how the, the members that were going to be uh, um, uh, receiving that news uh, that new policy and procedure uh, we took um others like uh, changing our clothes changing our uh, our shoes or, or disinfecting them things like that we changed the roster the uh, the shift was longer for avoiding the amount of people coming in the different homes um and my member of staff i mean adapted very well to that too and the other controversy was um we didn't accept anyone from from hospital without a, a negative COVID test. Uh, uh, that was against the the, um, the uh, government guidance, and and that was a little bit yeah 
we we had uh, some problems at the beginning, but we said you have your guidance and we understand you. You are doing what you need to do. And uh, but we have our own guidance. We are charity. We need to 100% um, to make sure that our residents are safe. And I think uh, if we don't do the test, they are going to spread it. And at the end, we were right. I mean, we were right because that has been one of the biggest um, ways to uh, spread the, the virus, um, I believe. And uh, But in that moment, was controversial with uh, the hospitals, with uh, uh, the county, with uh, everybody. But um, but little by little, and, and, and things happened and we were so pressing them to do the COVID test and some of them came positive and um, if you think what was going to happen if they come in and, and, and spread it and and isolation 14 days and it didn't work like that you need to do it in different ways other countries has done it in, in other ways but I saw how we could make um, all the residents, all the member staff, as safe as possible, and that is the only thing we were thinking of. How did how did that go down? Because I mean, I guess in the in the moment, I can see some of your decisions as being um, as being controversial, and I'm sure people are now looking back on them and, and thinking, "Wow, I'm I'm so glad that the Diagrama Foundation had the foresight to to, to make these decisions, albeit they were." Um, maybe people didn't appreciate them to start off with. Did did you get a lot of pushback, especially on <clears throat> when it comes to people moving into your into your homes? Because I know there was a lot of a lot of pressure to 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 admit residents to have people to to move in. I mean, what what was that like? Because I can imagine that that ruffled some feathers. Um, you are right. I mean, there was a lot of pressure. I remember being the SMT meeting. And before, the thing is, before that, that happened, before that people were, uh, or that the, the, the government or the NHS started to, uh, to move people from hospital to the care homes, uh, like one week before, we sat down and we said, um, uh, this is happening, or I remember saying to my, my management uh, team, this is happening in, my, uh, in other countries. We need to avoid coming from hospital with the um, without a test. I mean, I'm, I'm not a. I am going to accept anyone who has a, a negative test. I remember at the beginning saying, "Wow, well, th that is not going to happen because they are going to tell us and I said, yeah, yeah, it's going to happen. Is is what we need to do." And I remember the first time that my one of my colleagues there rang me and and, and they told me is. They are very unhappy because of what we have said. They, uh, we don't know even if we are going to have a contract uh, anymore. I mean, that that was the pressure, and uh, we needed to write a, a huge letter uh, explaining that we have never ever uh, say no to anybody coming to our uh, to our home. But um, now, and we are not saying now. The only thing we are asking is for a, a test done. Um, that didn't, we didn't have any response, as you can imagine. Um, but they were pressing us all the time. And, and we said it. I mean, I, I remember my colleague saying, the person who is in the middle is just doing their work and, and, and just finding a location. And I have nothing to do with what they need to do. They understood what we were doing. But they have bosses who said, you need to move these people. Um, my people, they said, yeah, but my chief executive said that without a test, it's not going to happen. <laughs> then that was a few, I would say it was like a seven, ten days of up and downs going. And, um, and, uh, and I think later they started to do it little by little. And, and at the end, as you say, it has a very, I think it has been one of the most positive things that we did. It was that, because if not, um, and I'm pretty sure other people have done it in the same way and even doing it you are not free of having the COVID I mean it's, it's you have to be very lucky and we I, I, I have to say that um, and, and we've been very uh, very lucky with everything that we've done one of um, uh, one of my guests 
uh, a gentleman by the name of Mark Lloyd, who's the managing director at uh, RMBI Careco. He, uh, I can't remember, we, we, we did an episode of the podcast together. I can't remember whether this was a, a gem that he shared just in one of our conversations or whether it was, uh, whether it was in the episode, but he said to, if you, if you have, um, what was it? Uh, if you have great leadership, um, great leadership, plenty of resources and plenty of luck, you might, might be okay. And that's, uh, I, I, I remember hearing that and thinking, you know what, that's a, uh, that's, that's a real truism, right? Cause you can, you can still have all of those, all of those things and still, and still not necessarily, um, come out un, unscathed. I guess the, 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 the thing that I'm, conscious of as we're as we're talking is the fact that you've had to make some really really difficult decisions which I'm sure there have been residents there have been family members there's obviously been commissioners and probably plenty of other people as well who have kind of said yeah you know what this is uh you, we're not comfortable with your with your decisions and then there's the uh, the the, uh, the the ensuing backlash that comes off the back of that but ultimately all of your homes have been COVID free, COVID free constantly throughout the entire process. So I'm just going to touch wood again for, for, for a second. Obviously it's uh, it's important to, uh, uh, to, 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 to maintain that of course, but I guess that's part of the role of a, of, of a leader, isn't it? You make decisions that are, that can be quite, quite controversial that people aren't necessarily going to be happy with, but they have to be done for the greater, greater good. And it seems like, um, that, that some of those decisions that, that you have made ultimately have, have, have served you and they served your team and they served the people that you're looking after and of course the, the families as, as well so uh, well done to, to you and your team for managing to, to, to maintain that and uh, long may it continue of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's what I just say I'm, I'm all the time the same and and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure other, other organization other care home has been working as hard as us and uh, and they've been unlucky because um, things like that happen is uh, I wish um, just with the hard work or or, or, or just making decision uh, everything everything happening in this way but it's not the case and um, and I'm pretty sure for any reason I mean no one wants COVID I mean that is 100% true no one for any reason, different reasons, no one wants to uh, to have COVID in in their home. Could be for humanitarian reasons, or could be from business reason. No one wants COVID in their home. That is a reason. I believe that everybody has been working very hard to avoid having having in um, uh, the the virus. Yeah, definitely, without shadow of a doubt. So, even before we'd. Uh, arranged for, for this podcast we said that we were going to do another podcast anyway um and the the reason why um that was uh, that was uh, that was interesting to me uh, firstly bless her julie your your uh, your, uh, your your colleague uh, introduced us in the initial instance but um i think i can't remember what she said she said something along the lines of I, i've watched a load of your episodes and i think you'd find david a really inspiring guy you should arrange to have a chat with him obviously we had a couple of conversations i certainly felt inspired and i think the the thing that i really enjoyed about your um uh, the conversations with you is the fact that we have uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, kind of a, a shared passion, if you like, around people and around and around culture. I know this, this is something that you're hugely, um, hugely passionate about, especially during the, uh, the, the, the COVID outbreak. Tell me about, um, I guess, your view on, on people, on culture, on the, on the, on the care workforce and how, uh, how you're, how you see the, the 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 people that work in this sector, the great people that have been so committed throughout these. Uh, uh, well, they're always super committed anyway. But I guess it's just had a, the the people have had a a, a a the light shone on them, if you uh, if you like, throughout this process. Well, the, um, that is something that uh, when I told you before that when I came to uh, this country, I didn't know anything about the field, and um, and I was needed to uh, research and, and and learn. One thing that uh, shocked me um, and in a bad way it was a, how and the value was the people um, was the field itself how um, uh, the the worst paid people in the whole country are those that are working with the most vulnerable and and I, I didn't feel right and, and also because I come from a country where you need to have university degrees for working in this field um, and, and and also the salary is uh, 
is, is quite good. I mean, you're not going to be rich ever. Uh, then, I mean, if you want to be rich, don't work in a charity and don't work in this field. But you have a good life. Um, and, and, and when I came here, I saw uh, very committed people. They are working long hours. Uh, I mean, the shifts are a killer. I mean, that is something that uh, would you expect a pilot to work 24 hours in a row? Do you expect uh, doctors to work uh, 24 hours in a row on several? This is something that I am being paid in minimum wage. Remember that. And, um, and that is something that um, struck me. And, um, and all the time I've been here now 12 years, all my meetings with my, my staff, I know all of them. Uh, anybody for coming to the organization have a, a, an interview process and I am like the last chain, I mean the last part of the chain and I like to meet everybody. And I want to make sure that um, it's a good person, it's intelligent and we can work together. It's, uh, they have the, the grammar ethos and, and principles and, and I told them, is, do you want to change the world? I mean, here is to change people, uh, to change, uh, uh, we cannot run an elderly care home and just waiting there for them to die. We need to, to, to make sure that the life is as best as possible. Um, uh, with uh, people with learning disability, we need to have full integration. And full integration is not them going to the community. Full integration is, is that there's not going to be activities with just people with learning disabilities because it tends to go to all together. Full integration is that people with and without um, learning disabilities go together. And, and my member of staff, I have to say, um, not just now, but before, they were working, I mean, extremely well. We have good in all rating, good in all the services we have. And, um, um, and also, I'm very proud about how all this happened. I know about, um, I can make the uh, decision about um, how to make it happen, but if they didn't trust us, uh, or, or me myself, is it would be very difficult and they trust I, I needed to speak to them and they trust what i was saying is i was saying this is happening everywhere i mean not just here in other part of the world i have as you can imagine people in the car sector are from everywhere they are british italians from romania um thailand i can think kenya it's, it's worldwide I, I have people from everywhere and uh, and and i said to them is we need to do something, we need to make them safe. And everybody was spot on. That is something that, uh, um, of course, they didn't like to, uh, to wear several days in a row the, the mask. I said, I know, I've been, I, I remember even the manager uh, were um, calling the provider of masks saying if it was safe for our member staff, it was. And, and we said, there is no virus here. Then it's not going to be, I mean, the only thing is going to be is, is to minimize the risk. That is not going to avoid anything. It's just minimizing the risk. They were a spot on. When I changed the roster and I said, we all, I, I went Saturday, Sundays, I mean, we all need to change roster. Um, this is not going to be just coming for a shift. It's going to be a, a longer shift. Are you happy with that? And yes, they were happy with that, and, and they're still doing it, and, and we are going to keep it. That is the, the, the thing that you can, or I can praise all, the, um, all my workers, and, and I have to say that all the care workers, it's not that because they are mine, it's, it's, I'm pretty sure that happened everywhere. Um, and I, we've been uh, very well um, praising NHS because they are doing an amazing job, but also we cannot forget about all these care workers um, um, leaving home, going to uh, and put themselves at risk, going to supermarket to buy things to the for the residents, do everything that using the transport, and they've been doing it um, and being scared about their own families, about uh, spreading the virus and, and, and kill people because at the end it was us who was uh, 
um, the possibility to uh, spread the, the virus. And I have to say that um, we need to think very, very um, well. And I think when I say we, it's the big we, the, the country, if we really want uh, uh, to have member staff who has been supporting the whole country, uh, in that condition of having minimum minimum wage of not having the in the invest that we need to do as an organization i think that every single day but also about the uh, how how this field is paid by the local authorities or by government or by nhs or whatever they need to think about what need to what is a, a cost of having a very good service. And when you have good people, you are not going to, I mean, one of the first quotes I, uh, or says I, I learned here is uh, pay peanuts, you get monkeys. I mean, we all knew about that. We cannot pay peanuts to these people because uh, they, they are not monkeys to start with. And they are, um, they are working so, so hard for, for vulnerable people. I think that is something that I, I want to say about the, um, the staff that, um, th that they are supporting of this care sector. Mm. When, whilst we've been talking, you've, you, you've mentioned Spain a couple of times for, for, for obvious reasons. I guess you've got kind of points of reference over there. Diagram Foundation is still active over in, in Spain as well. And I know that you talk to the, to the people over there too. So um, can you, can you give me some insight? Uh, I'm sure you will have been observing closely what's what's going on in Spain. Um, can you give me a bit of an insight into what how has Spain coped from a from a care perspective? And then also, I guess, kind of what lessons we can learn from from Spain as their uh, as their experience has obviously been different to ours. I would say not many. <laughs> I would say that they have been through the same position they they were too late to uh, to react i believe uh, some countries has been very late i think later they were very thorough in the way that they did things but there are not many countries uh, because i have not been just looking at spain it's germany south korea italy uh, new zealand i think there are a lot of examples from from different perspectives um, from Spain, what I, I can learn is what is going on now. That is, is a lot of spikes, and it's, um, and there, there are two, two things very clear. We need to use masks all the time. That is something that we need to do now, and it's all the time you go out, use mask and social distancing. The problem is uh, is coming now. Is summertime. Uh, there are. Um, there are, I don't know, discotheques, young people who want to enjoy. And, and, I mean, and, and they believe, I've been young, and I know that uh, when you are young, you think that, um, that you, are, uh, you are not going to be destroyed like other people. You are young and you are strong. This is for the elderly or for the, it's not for me. Then this is happening in this moment in time. I, uh, there are some counties that are thinking to close down again. Uh, in a lockdown, and this is something that we need to think here. Um, you go to uh, to London and you see so many people with no mask or no having social distancing. You know. mm, I believe I've been speaking to some people uh, from from elsewhere also, and we need to think about September, October, when there is going to be the normal flu, and it's going to be a normal flu. It's going to be COVID, it's not going to be COVID. It's going to be like, a, we are going to be lost. We are not going to know if it's a normal flu, if it's going to be COVID, if it's going to be another, a different thing. Then we need to, uh, to be um, prepared as much as possible of, of having this second wave. I mean, that is, uh, I don't want to be alarmistic in terms of, it's not going to become worse or whatever. No, no, it's just, let's keep on, and I say this to my member staff is, this is it, it hasn't stopped good weather and the sun here uh forgets that we can still have in the COVID because people think oh it's like the flu it's not like the flu um you can have it 
the good weather and if you don't have um, any um, symptoms uh, makes you to be relaxed. We cannot be relaxed until there is a vaccine. That is the reality. The reality is, uh, and that is what I have learned from, again, not just Spain, also Germany, China, um, and, and all these countries that they have several reactions. Uh, the reaction of being at home as soon as possible and lockdown, I think it was well done here, but I think it should be done a few weeks before when other countries were, we shouldn't be waiting for, for this to come. And, and that is my, again, it is my opinion. I'm not a doctor. I'm just, um, I just run um, care the, or, or different services in the care sector. And, um, but it's my common sense is uh, we need to be prepared. That is what I've learned from, from them. I guess you can only talk from experience, right? And uh, you've been you've been in the thick of it with your with your team. So I'd say that you have a pretty valid, uh, really pretty valid um, uh, experience and points of data for for all of this stuff. So uh, so yeah, I'm sure people will will heed your uh, your your wise words. Um, so just just before we wrap up, if there was one thing that you could encourage the leaders of care home businesses to uh, to do, or even the wider social care world. What would that one thing be that you think that would make the, the biggest difference at the moment? Um, follow your gut. Um, if you think that something is common sense and you can justify your decision, do it. I mean, if it's uh, over the guidance, do it. If you need to explain to families, to residents, to why you are doing it, don't let don't wait for other people to tell you what to do that is something that i have learned here is i, I couldn't wait for uh any guidance uh, because i needed to make sure that i did the the best for the resident and my member staff and um and my family at the end i mean it's, it's everybody and you need to make decision and i would say to them oh yeah follow your guts do whatever you think that is best for for your people around and, and do it. We are going to have mistakes. Even any decision that I'm pretty sure any decision that I've made and, and now has been positive. Some of the decision maybe was was not that positive. I need to analyze better. But we need to learn. And don't be worried about having mistakes. It's better having mistakes that don't do anything. That makes sense. Uh, and um, that is what I will do. Uh, or I would say to them is. Just follow what you think that is the best thing for for you and your um, your uh, your people. Sure, wise words, David. It's been a real pleasure pleasure having you on the Care Home Show. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today. Thank you so so much for having me. A pleasure, and I'll speak to you soon. Very welcome.